My name is Jen Babic, and I'm an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at UCSF. I'm also an associate program director for the Internal Medicine Residency and the Infectious Disease Fellowship. We're really excited to be with you here today to talk about updates in COVID-19. Hi, this is Brian Schwartz. I'm professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. I'm also the program director for our Infectious Diseases Fellowship Program here at UCSF and one of the course directors for the Medical Student Microbiology and Immunology Block. It's a real privilege to be able to talk to you today about COVID-19. All right, let's get started. So the outline for our talk today is we're gonna talk about the virology and pathogenesis, the epidemiology and clinical manifestations, diagnosis, treatment, and then finish with a discussion of prevention. I'm gonna start off by talking about virology and pathogenesis. I think before we really get started into talking about this disease, we need to go over a couple important definitions. When I was first learning about this disease process, I found this very confusing and I think it's really worth spending some time going over. So the virus that we're dealing with here is SARS-CoV-2. The original SARS virus was SARS-CoV, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. As I said, the present virus that we're dealing with is SARS-CoV-2, which is very similar, although not identical to the original SARS virus. When we're talking about the disease, we're talking about COVID-19, which is coronavirus disease, which is due to SARS-CoV-2. So some, there's three big questions that I think come up when we think about the virology and pathogenesis of this disease. One, how did it spread to humans? Two, why is it spreading so fast when we compare it to the original SARS virus? And three, how does it cause respiratory failure in a subset of patients? Unfortunately, we really at this time do not have a good understanding to any of these questions, but I'm gonna share with you today what is known. So how is SARS-CoV-2 spread to humans? Well, when we think about coronaviruses, they are RNA viruses with spike-like surface proteins, and that's how they get the name coronavirus. Most of the coronaviruses we deal with on a regular basis are spread from human to human, and they cause upper respiratory tract infections. However, there are some coronaviruses that are of animal origin, or they were in animal hosts. There was the SARS-CoV, the original SARS virus, in 2002, it was originally found in China and spread. There's the MERS-CoV, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, first identified in 2012 in the Arabian Peninsula. And then our most recent one, SARS-CoV-2, originated in China. Now, it's felt that bats are probably the originator of most of these viruses, and then they can be spread to camels and then to humans like MERS-CoV or like the original SARS, maybe to a bat, and then some other mammal, and then to humans. It's really not clear if there was an intermediate for SARS-CoV-2. What is really interesting, though, is that in studies of the coronaviruses in bats, about 30% of them are actually able to directly infect humans at any time. So what that means to me is this, unfortunately, will likely not be our last coronavirus outbreak. So why is this coronavirus spreading so fast when we compare it to the original SARS? Well, there was a study that was recently published that looked to see if it stays on surfaces longer than the original SARS. Here, this image is showing its ability to stay in plastic, and you can see here the half-life is really no different. So this is probably not the primary issue. This same study looked to see if it was able to retain in aerosols longer. And you can see here as well that there really was no difference in the ability of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV to be able to stay in aerosols. And this is probably not the main difference. So what is it? Well, some recent studies looked at viral shedding. And when you compare to that of the original SARS, there seems to be a difference. So what they found in a recent study is that there's high level early viral shedding from the upper respiratory tract in patients with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you can see here in this figure that in patients at the, at the onset of their symptoms already have high viral loads in their throat and nasal swabs. If you go back and look at data from the original SARS virus, the peak in viral shedding happened much later after the patients um, had been symptomatic for quite a while and probably were restricted from uh, other people. 
But here, if you have early shedding at the very uh, onset of symptoms, you may be even shedding the day before, and it's possible that this is one of the main reasons. The last big question is, how does it cause acute respiratory distress syndrome? And again, we really don't have a good understanding. What we do know is that SARS-CoV-2 infects epithelial cells in the lower respiratory tract, and it binds by the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptor in these small airways. And in a subset of these patients, we see them go on to severe respiratory failure. But what's going on in the in-between? Studies that we have so far suggest that there's significant immune activation. We see elevations in IL-6. We see dysregulation of T cells. And pathology shows diffuse al alveolar damage. There are decreased in viral titers with increasing disease, which does suggest that it is possible that this is an immune-mediated process. I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Babic to talk about the epidemiology of this process. Thanks, Brian. The first thing we're going to talk about in epidemiology is we're going to talk about a basic timeline of COVID-19. So in December of 2019, there was a pneumonia of unknown cause identified in Wuhan, China. The initial cases all had exposure to a seafood market, but then later cases did not, and there was evidence then of person-to-person -person transmission. From January to March 2020, the virus was identified as a novel coronavirus causing this disease, and then there was rapid spread within China and now worldwide. On March 11th, 2020, the WHO declared a pandemic. If we think a little bit about the spread of SARS-CoV-2, Brian already alluded to this, but if we think about the contagiousness of the virus, this is described as the R0 or the basic reproduction number. The R0 of SARS-CoV-2 is estimated to be somewhere between 2.24 and 3.58. In the graphic that's shown there, with an estimated R0 of 2 to 2.5, what you can see, that what this means, is that one infected person will on average infect about two and a half other people. Now, if we compare the R0 of SARS-CoV-2 to other viruses, you can see that it lands somewhere in the middle. Measles, which has an R0 of approximately 15, is very contagious, whereas MERS or seasonal influenza have an R0 that is much lower, and COVID-19 is somewhere in the middle. Now, if we look at what's been happening in the world, as we discussed, there is a global pandemic. COVID-19 is now in 160 countries, as of yesterday, which was uh, March 19th, there were 244,517 cases and over 10,000 deaths. The situation in Italy has gotten a lot of attention over the last few weeks. Um, as of now, it is now uh, probably the epicenter of the disease in Europe. They've had 22,000 cases, over 1,600 deaths, Interestingly, their population is 60% um, men and 40% women in terms of their cases. By age, they've had a, a distribution of cases throughout the different age groups, although about a third of their cases were in people over 70. And you can see by the map that most of the cases have been concentrated in Northern Italy. In the United States, there have been cases of COVID-19 in all 50 states. As you can see by the map, um, the main episode centers in the United States are in Washington, in California, in the Bay Area, and then in the Northeast, mostly in New York. There have been 10,442 cases as of yesterday and 150 deaths. If we look at California, um, again, as of March 19th, there have been over 1,000 cases and 19 deaths. Um, the distribution of our cases have been about a third uh, in those eight, over 65 and two thirds in those uh, under 65, but only 2% of cases have been in those under 18. And you can see by the map that again, the cases in California have been mostly in the Bay Area. If we look at San Francisco, you can see that there have been 70 cases and zero deaths. Again, those are numbers as of March 19th. In San Mateo, they have had 89 cases and one death, and Santa Clara, which has had the most cases to date, uh, 189 cases and six deaths. There's been a lot of attention to the phrase flattening the curve, so I just wanted to take a moment to explain what is meant by this. So if you look at the yellow curve, this is what a curve would look like in terms of the number of daily cases over time without any specific 
aggressive public health measures. Flattening the curve refers to going from the yellow to the blue curve and using aggressive public health measures to get there. Now, if we look at the graph all the way on the right, we can think about what lessons we've learned from the 1918 influenza pandemic, where certain cities were able to flatten the curve by aggressive public health measures such as shelter in place, closing schools, et cetera. You can see in the dark line, which is Philadelphia, where they did not react aggressively to cases that first appeared in their city and they had um, a lot of deaths in their city. The dotted line represents St. Louis, which reacted uh, much differently when they had their first cases. They closed their schools, they canceled public outings. You can see that they were able to flatten the curve and they had much fewer deaths in their population. There was only a difference in 14 days in implementing social distancing between the two cities, and there was a very significant difference in the epidemic curves. Next, we're going to talk about the clinical manifestations of COVID-19. If we first think about the disease categorization, most of the cases of COVID-19 are non-severe, so about 70 to 80 percent. 15 to 25 percent are severe, and 5 percent are ICU level care. The most common symptoms of COVID-19 are fever, cough, shortness of breath, and myalgias. Fever is present in most patients at some point during their course, but only 50% on admission. So that's important because if a patient with a respiratory illness presents without a fever, that does not exclude COVID-19. The triad of fever, cough, and shortness of breath is found in only 15%. Some of the less common symptoms are URI symptoms, including headache, sore throat, and rhinorrhea, which are seen in less than 15%, and GI symptoms, where nausea vomiting is seen in less than 10% and diarrhea in less than 25%. In terms of the labs that are seen with COVID-19, routine labs usually show a median white count that is normal with a leukopenia in up to 54% and a leukocytosis in less than 25%. Lymphopenia is seen anywhere between a third of patients and up to 85% of patients. So leukopenia and lymphopenia are important clues to the diagnosis of COVID-19. The median platelet count is usually normal, although you can see a slight decrease in less than a third of patients. There can also be an increase in the AST or ALT in up to a third of patients. There's been a lot of attention paid to possible biomarkers that could help distinguish between COVID-19 and other respiratory diseases. The CRP and the LDH are increased in a large proportion of patients, but not in a way that is useful for discriminating between diseases. The procalcitonin has also been studied using a cutoff of 0.5 in most of the studies that have come out of China. And note this is a higher cutoff than is usually used uh, in the U.S. But in their studies, they saw a procalcitonin of greater than 0.5 in only 5 to 10 percent of patients, although it was seen in a higher proportion of patients if they were severely ill, up to 14 percent, or critically ill, seen in up to 24 percent of those patients. In terms of the possibility of viral or bacterial co-infections, this is an area that is still not well understood. The co-infection rate in published reports to date in adults is only 0 to 6%, but it's not clear if testing was systematic in these studies, and this very well may be an underestimate of the true co-infection rate. There are multiple case reports of co-infection with other respiratory viruses, including with influenza. So importantly, the detection of an alternative viral infection makes COVID-19 less likely, but does not rule it out. Similarly, bacterial co-infection likely increases with the severity of illness, so seeing a bacterial infection in a severely ill patient does not exclude COVID-19. In terms of imaging, chest X-ray is abnormal in about 60% of patients and 77% if they present with a severe illness. The chest CT is abnormal in about 86%, and 95% with severe illness. There are bilateral findings on chest X-ray and CT in 75 to 90%, but it can be unilateral, especially early or with mild disease. The most common findings are ground glass opacities and or patchy consolidations, and these can be seen in a peripheral distribution in a majority of patients. Some other less common CT findings are nodules, lymphadenopathy, cysts, effusions, or crazy paving. CT may be more sensitive in early COVID-19 disease compared to upper tract PCR testing. 
In terms of the clinical course of COVID-19, this is from a study that was in Lancet last week of 191 hospitalized patients in Wuhan with known outcome. It looked at 137 survivors versus 54 non-survivors. And you can see by looking at the colored bars, you can see the progression of their symptoms over time. Both groups had fever and cough present at the beginning of their illness and throughout their course. Dyspnea, which is the dark blue bar, came on in both groups around day seven. Sepsis and ARDS, which are shown by the arrows at the bottom, came at about day nine to 10 for sepsis and day 10 to 12 for ARDS. When patients were admitted to the ICU, this happened around day 12 in both groups. And then in the group of non-survivors who were mechanically ventilated, this happened around day 15. And then this group of patients, uh, death happened usually around day 19. And in the survivors, they were discharged around day 22. In terms of case fatality rates, there have been different rates that have come out of different countries. So in China, the case fatality rate is estimated to be somewhere between 2.3 and 3.8%. In Italy, the preliminary numbers that came out on March 15th showed a case fatality rate of 7.2%. And then the initial reports from Korea that also came out in the last two weeks are a case fatality rate of 0.5%. The reasons for these differences are probably multifactorial. One probably has to do with testing. So we know that Korea has done an extensive amount of testing, so they're probably picking up a lot more of the mild diseases, whereas in Italy and China, this may not have been as much the case. The other possibility to explain the increased mortality rate in Italy is that they have a much older population. They have one of the oldest populations in Europe. And on that point, older age is thought to be the main risk factor for death when it has been looked at in multivariate analyses. Some of the other factors have been being male, having comorbidities such as cardiopulmonary disease, diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. Now, the graph here in the red shows the case fatality rate by age in China, and then I've superimposed the case fatality rate by age in Italy in the blue text. You can see that the case fatality rate remains quite low up through the 40s and 50s and really takes off over the age of 60 with a case fatality rate in the 60s of around 3.5, and then a case fatality rate over 70 of somewhere between 8 and 12.5% and then a case fatality rate over 80 of anywhere from 15 to 20% or more. Now we've just had some preliminary data from our first 4,000 or so cases in the United States that came out in the MMWR on March 18th. There's a wide case distribution of age, as you can see in the pie chart here. Um, this may change as our testing becomes more extensive, but importantly, as has been seen in other countries, only 5% of our cases are in those under the age of 20. They then looked at each age group in terms of their rates of hospitalization, ICU admission, and case fatality rates. There are ranges here because they had a lot of missing data to account for. But importantly, what you can see is that the hospitalization rate, the ICU admission rate, and the case fatality rate all increase with age. And again, really pick up um, once you're over kind of the 50 to 60 age range. The estimated case fatality rate in the United States so far is somewhere between 1.8 and 3.4%. But again, this is very, very preliminary data. An important point that came out of the study is that adults greater than or equal to 65 years old are only 31% of cases, but represent 45% of hospitalizations, 53% of ICU admissions, and 80% of deaths. Again, underlining the importance of age as a risk factor for poor outcomes with COVID-19. Lastly, I want to say to all of the frontline clinicians, it's important to remember to take a diagnostic timeout when you're evaluating patients with respiratory illness. We're bombarded with information in all aspects of our lives about coronavirus, but it's important to make sure that we think about other diagnoses that are not novel coronavirus when evaluating these patients. I'm going to hand it back over to Brian now to talk about diagnosis. Thank you. So how is the diagnosis of COVID-19 made most commonly? Well, we use PCR as our primary method, and we usually use a nasopharyngeal swab to make this diagnosis. The nasopharyngeal swab is passed through the nose into the back of the pharynx, and cells are collected in a viral culture media. The sensitivity of this test is about 75 to 
One question that frequently comes up is how long is a patient positive by PCR, or we often term it as viral shedding? Well, several studies have looked at this, and they found that shedding can be range from about 12 to 20 days, although some, some patients sometimes can shed for longer. An important thing to think about, though, is, is shedding necessarily equal to in, infectivity? And I think the answer is probably not, although this is something we're still gathering more data on. One study looked at viral culture instead of just shedding and found that cultures are positive only for about 10 days, which would make you think that somebody's infective probably shorter than 20 days. Serology will be an important test for us to better understand the epidemiology of COVID-19, although it is not yet available in the United States. We're gonna now move on to talk about treatment. Now, unfortunately, there is no FDA approved treatment for COVID-19, and we're still trying to better understand what the best options are. As Dr. Bapit had shared what the trajectory of disease is, Usually early on, patients have fever, and then later on, they'll go on to develop respiratory failure. Some people think that the early part of the disease is clearly virally mediated, and it's possible that the latter disease, where the patient goes on to develop ARDS, may be more immune mediated. Therefore, one might think about treatment options as early phase as thinking about using antiviral therapies, such as remdesivir, which we are part of a randomized control trial at the NIH and enrolling patients. It's an RNA-dependent polymerase inhibitor. Other drugs include chloroquine. And then lopinavir ritonavir is a drug that had been used for HIV and a randomized control trial that was done in China recently was published, but did not show that it was effective. There are people looking at anti-inflammatories for possible treatment as well. There's studies looking at IL-6 receptor blockers and steroids. One of the reasons people are looking at IL-6 receptor blockers is because it's found that patients have very high IL-6 levels. But it's important to remember that just having a high level in the blood does not mean that blocking that is gonna result in better outcomes. I think a good example is in TNF inhibitors. Patients in sepsis had high TNF levels, and so therefore they studied TNF inhibitors in that population. And unfortunately, TNF inhibitors resulted in increased mortality. So I think these are areas we're still trying to get more information. And at this time, there is no gold standard treatment. And hopefully, we'll be doing multiple randomized control trials to help us better understand the best treatment for our patients. The last thing I'm going to talk about is prevention. So to think about prevention, I think it's important to think about what are the main modes that a patient can spread the infection. So droplets in the air, which usually go from about three to six feet from a patient, is thought to be the primary mode of transmission. However, contact, these droplet particles, that contain virus, can live on surfaces, so contact can be another method as well. To prevent droplets, we recommend using a surgical mask and eye protection. And to prevent contact, when you see a patient in, the, in a room, you would wear a gown and gloves. One other important thing to remember though, is when patients are undergoing aerosolized generating procedures, such as intubation, nebul nebulizer use, high flow oxygen, that these viral particles can be spread via a different method. And to protect yourself from that, in those specific situations, you would exchange your surgical mask for an N95 mask, and the patient would be put in a negative pressure isolation room. The last thing that we wanna leave for you are some reliable resources that we use on a regular basis to keep up to date on COVID-19. There is a fantastic website put together at UCSF going over our own infection control and treatment practices the CDC, the California Department of Public Health, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and the WHO are all reliable and excellent resources. We want to finish by saying that we want to appreciate all our colleagues who have been working so hard to provide care for many patients with this disease and support our community at whole. Thank you.